I hope you all are aware about our Muslim Majlis, University of Peradeniya. So it was a wonderful journey video, what we have come through annually through this voyage, and we hope and expect for more success and achievements as well in future. Now I will hand over this opportunity to Safla. It's over to you, Safla. Yes. Thank you, Zamri. Well, we start a new venture with a lot of hard work. Here's the call for such a person who was always there with us in the ups and downs and was a great strength throughout the year of our majlis. This invitation is none, is none other than the president of our majlis, Ayel Afshan Ahmed, to give away the welcome address. Jazakallahu khairan, Shafla. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kai Bowan and Wanakam to all the guests, esteemed speakers, and participants present here on this special occasion. It gives me great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to our keynote speakers for this evening. Our first keynote speaker is Reverend Vijitapura Gunaratna. He is a PhD candidate of the University of Malaya and senior lecturer of the Department of Pali and Buddhist Studies in University of Kalani. And our second keynote speaker of the evening is Father Professor Dr. Josh Nandikara. He is the Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Dharma and Regional Director of Globethics.net India, and also Professor of Philosophy in Dharma Vida Shetra in Christ University, Bangalore, India. And our third keynote speaker is Dr. Mohammed Ismat Ramzi. He is the Editor of Malaysian Online Journal of Education Management, which is a Scopus Index Journal, and also he is the Chair of the Education for Humanism and Social Advancements Research Center, Faculty of Education, University of Malaya, Malaysia. And our fourth keynote speaker is Sri Swami Swatmananda. He attained dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and also Masters in International Management and in Global Master of Administration. We are truly honored to have you all here despite you, your busy schedules. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our senior treasurer of Muslim Majlis, Mr. MSM Razi, and other lecturers, undergraduates, and all the other participants who have joined us today. Today's event is a unique opportunity for all of us to gain insight into the various perspectives on fasting across different religions. It is an opportunity for us to deepen our understanding of the practices, values, and beliefs that unite us all as human beings. We hope that this evening will be an enriching and enlightening experience for everyone. We hope that we will all live with a greater appreciation and understanding of the role of fasting in different religions. As we move forward with the event, we would like to express our gratitude to everyone who has made this possible. We would also like to acknowledge and appreciate the efforts of the Muslim Majlis of University of Peradeniya for organizing this event. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the event and find it informative and insightful. Thank you. Yes, thank you, brother. And without further ado, let me dive to the fact for what we have gathered today. So once again, I would extend my warm welcome to all presented here for this live webinar on fasting in religions. So what is fasting? Well, it can be said as one of the teachings or rituals or kind of worship performed by different religious people as one of the noble parts. It has been practiced for thousands of years. However, fasting is different from one religion to another in various aspects. Sometimes the method may differ. Sometimes the period, I mean like the time period may differ. And sometimes the purpose of fasting may differ. Likewise, there are differences and even similarities of fasting in religions. So here we are today 
to explore the various aspects of fasting in religions with our experienced panel of experts from both local and international levels. So before introducing our first speaker, let me remind that all our viewers here, so I'm, I would like to remind all our viewers here that we have arranged an Q&A session at the end of the discussion. For that, we have already sent a link in the chat box. So if you ha all have any question to be asked from the uh, guest speakers tonight, you all can drop a message. So please make sure to type the question and the, um, I mean, and the prominent religious speaker you want to convey the question to. So, and, I, and we also appreciate if you guys can also include your names, uh, if you guys wish to, okay? So let me introduce our first keynote speaker tonight, the Buddhist prominent scholar and PhD candidate at the University of Malaya, Reverend Vijitapura Gunaratana Thero, who is also a senior lecturer of the Department of Pali and Buddhist Studies at the University of Kalania. He has also completed his master's and bachelor's degrees in Pali and Buddhist studies at the University of Kalanian. He has also been the coordinator, faculty of graduate studies and center, of, center for external examinations, Buddhist and Pali University of Sri Lanka in 2020. He has also won the prize of Syama Rajya Thyagya in 1997. Also, Reverend Gunaratna Tero has engaged in numerous researchers and publications. We are much honored and pleased to invite you to this live webinar. So coming to the point of today's discussion, what is fasting according to Buddhism? Um, dear Reverend Vishdapura Gonratna Tero, are you audible? Am I audible? Can you hear me? Uh, dear Reverend, I think you are muted. Can you hear me? It's over to you to talk on today's topic. Thank you very much. So, good evening, everybody. I am Venerable Gunaratana. Thank you very much for introducing me briefly. Uh, I think time is limited for us today. Uh, in first, I would say uh, Happy Ramadan, all of you, my Muslim brothers and sisters who are gathering here. And also, thank you very much, Dr. Ramsit, uh, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of uh, 
uh, education university of malaya for giving uh, for inviting me to address today so without wasting our valuable time i uh, i would like to start my presentation regarding the uh, buddhism in fasting in buddhism i think uh, you can see the slides so um, uh, so this topic is so vast but time is limited therefore i have to say that in first sorry for that uh, with the limited time i would like to bind up my discussion today so as you know in buddhism uh, there are a variety of attitude towards the different forms of fasting so the fasting is called the upavasa then anasana or the vikala bojana with regard to the buddhist text so the i would say first buddhism does not reject the fasting and also the fasting is appreciated by the buddha before his enlightenment buddha also practiced the different types of uh, fasting uh for the liberation or the emancipation as you know so then uh buddha appreciated after being enlightenment uh so therefore we can uh, introduce some points what type of fasting buddha appreciated and also how we introduce that so as you know the we have some uh disciplinary rules for monks and nuns with regard to the the uh, primary and the secondary sources after 20 years of the enlightenment buddha laid down the uh, the rules for monks and the nuns so the there are two types of rules for monks and nuns uh, the major rules and the minor rules in the list of the minor rules you the you can identify the, the uh, that one must not eat after the noon meal that means abstain from meal from lunch to breakfast so that is the place where we can identify how monks and nuns abstain from the meal so this is one such example uh, how would the laid down as a, as a rule in the list of minor rules so the, during this period what monks and nuns can do so it should be used for the meditation or the chanting so if one breaks the rule it is considered an offense so as i mentioned earlier this is the list of the minor rule therefore there is no punishment but it is need to be confessed that is the removal of that the uh, the uh, vine rule so this is one such then uh, let us see how this uh, uh, the uh, fasting reflects in the lay society so lay society also follow this rule not as monks and nuns in the community but that is uh, the one fasting reflex in the one of the eight precept during the important days of religious observance that is called the attanga seal or singly we say atta seal so in that religious observance one rule is there so the they they have to follow up that too so as i mentioned earlier buddha also appreciated the fasting he stated thus i abstain from eating at night by doing this i am free from disease and suffering there are the benefits of fasting in the uh, buddhist perspective and i enjoy health strength and a comfortable life after he after he uh, the achievement of the uh, enlightenment so he stated thus and also he advised monks of abstain from suffer by doing this 
you too will be free from disease and suffering and you will enjoy health, strength and comfortable residence. Though this is the advice given by the Buddha for the monks and nuns and the benefits of the fasting is stated thus. Uh, Buddha recommended these types of fasting afternoon for health reasons. That's why he stated that I do not eat in the evening and thus I am free from illness and affliction and enjoy health, strength and ease. So this is we find out in the uh, primary sources and the secondary sources. There are four such types of uh, uh, the statements are very important with regard to the Buddhist text. And also, in the Theravada Buddhist monasticism, there are the various the optional ascetic practices. Those ascetic practices are called the Dutang. So several of them which have to do with the food, I will draw your attention towards the two of them. One is Ekasanikang. There are 13 types of ascetic practices in the Buddhism. So one is one cessationer's practice that is called the Ekasanikang. So it refers to eating only one meal a day. So, so monks and nuns also can follow this, uh, uh, the ascetic practices. So in that, since we can identify how Buddhism refers to eating only one meal a day. So that is a type of fasting in the uh, Dutanga or the ascetic practice, practices in the Theravada Buddhism. So another one is Patapindikanga. So that is also a kind of ascetic practice. So this practice consists of only eating food collected in the one's ball during the daily arms round that is called the Pindapath, during which monks go begging for food. So it interesting thing is here, if one happens to receive just a little food or not to receive any at all on one particular day, one would have to fast. If there is no any receivance of the food, he must have to fast. So this is also one such uh, the significant fact how monks and nuns are following the ascetic practices with regard to the uh, fasting. Mm -hmm. So what is the significance of the ascetic practices? So this is means to deepen one's spiritual practice in order to achieve the emancipation or the liberation or in order to develop the uh, concentration. So they have to follow up such types of ascetic practices with regard to the Buddhism. And also this is a very good spiritual practice, not only that, but the develop the detachment from the material things including the body. So the, the, these types of uh, the significances are reflected in the Theravada Buddhism with regard to the ascetic practices. So these are the places where how Buddhism appreciates the, uh, the fasting with regard to the, the, uh, uh, the aspects. So let us see how the, uh, the fasting reflects for the lay society. So as you know, so there is eight precepts. One of them is, I resolve to train myself to avoid eating food afternoon. So lay society also follow such type of uh, the precepts. One is avoid hmm, eating food afternoon. That also they are abstain from uh, the meal, afternoon to uh, next morning. Mm -hmm. So fasting is not the controlling oneself from eating and the drinking. So this also indicates how the fasting is not controlling oneself from eating and drinking, but including all movements of the mind, speech and body. 
so the it is a verbal training and the body training so like that of hmm, the important moments are given throughout this way this is for the uh, the lay people's per perception so and also it is related to the morality with regard to the buddhism i'm sure that all can identify how the fasting is related to the morality so in that sense buddhism has three important points in the teachings of morality what morality is so we have to identify the three points the first must speak the truth during that period if one if one follow in the fasting or if one abstain from the food from uh, afternoon to next morning he must speak the truth not lie lie to yourself or lie to others hmm? so that means not only for myself but also for others that is one such important fact secondly he has to do right hmm? when buddhists carry out the fasting it is recommended to do the right thing any activity that is done must be right there is no any opportunity to follow the wrong views wrong activities during that period because this is the development of morality so this is how the fasting is related to the morality verbally and the bodily thirdly must earn a lawful living in the sense of earning a lawful living as recommended by the lord buddha so it is important that how the fasting is related to the morality for the development of the concentration and also this is the one way of practicing self control from on for all forms of the unwholesome thoughts generally we generate the unwholesome thoughts we have to refrain from them if one follows the fasting so he can refrain from such unwholesome thoughts and also it is an attempt to free oneself from all forms of evil greed hatred and the delusion and the illusion so that means if one practices the fasting he can free from all forms of evil so that is one such important fact for the lay people if one practices the fasting so it is clear now this is the generally included into the teachings of morality it can help to control oneself from all the roots of evil all the roots of evil mean the greed hatred and the delusion if one wants to refrain from such the roots of evil then he has to practice such types of fasting tradition in the buddhism and also buddhists have the opportunity to fast which is indicated by the buddha in a month of four times so in the uposatha or the poya days we have such type of the specific uh, the times and the days so in that the during that days we can follow up such types of the uh, precepts so in general so buddhism indicates you can follow up fasting in a month of four times and also buddhists who want to fast must practice the eight elements of practice which are often called the eight precepts as i mentioned earlier this is included into the list of the eight precepts if one follows that then he can refrain from these defilements okay we come to the conclusion so buddhists who do fasting will get health benefits as i mentioned earlier how would they appreciate it while he was practicing the fasting and also after attainment of the nibbana so how he appreciated and ordered to follow for the 
monks and the nuns in order to achieve the emancipation. This is one such. And secondly, if foods and drinks are avoided, they will be beneficial and healthy for the body. So the, we have many diseases in the modern society related to the foods and drinks. So if one avoid from them, so this is a beneficial and beneficial uh, healthy for the body. And also carry out physical and spiritual development. So as I mentioned earlier, how such the rules are laid down by the Buddha for the monks and nuns. So that means if they follow up that, then they can uh, develop, develop their spiritual concentration. This is one such. And also for lay people live in peace and comfort in heaven after dying where they can born. So it is indicated here, they are comfort in heaven. And also physically, the body will always be healthy because he keeps his diet. So that is also related to first benefit. And also spiritually, heart will always be calm and strong. So that is also significant for the development of the concentration. Finally, controlling oneself to erode sin and delusion. So this is one such aim for the uh, Buddhist followers. So how they erode sin and delusion. So the finally, they can control such type of defilements, then finally and gradually they come to the, their final destination. Thank you very much for listening to me and giving me this opportunity to address you. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you, Reverend, for wishing us a happy Ramazan. Um, by the way, like uh, through our Reverend's speech, uh, we got to know that uh, Buddhism appreciates fasting. So not only that, uh, I have also heard uh, in one of Buddhist uh, all disciplines asking him that uh, what is the point of fasting from Lord Buddha so at that point he was fasting for about 50 days and he looked at him and smiled and said that I do fast because I can laugh in the face of hunger if I'm not wrong so and uh, he all uh, reverend also um, noted the point that he uh, recommend Lord Buddha has recommended fasting for health benefits and it's a way of practicing um, the self-control so, um, and um, so thank you very much, uh, Reverend Vishdapura Gunratna uh, Tero. Uh, we hope that we have got a clear idea of what is fasting in Buddhism. Thank you very much. Yeah, and guys, I would like to remind that uh, we have a Q&A session. So, so if you feel any in, uh, uncomfortableness in language, uh, you can like, type your uh, questions in any language so we can translate it and give it to, I mean, like we can direct it to our, our guest speakers tonight. So, and now let's move on to our next guest speaker of today's session, who is a Christian prominent. He is the editor in chief of Journal of Dharma, regional director of Globetics.net India, professor of philosophy at Dharma Ram Vidya Shetram and Christ University in Bangalore, India. He is a PhD holder in philosophy at Warwick University in UK, and he has also completed his master's in philosophy and theology at the Oxford University in UK. He has widely experienced in researchers and publications and has published <coughs> seven books in religion and philosophy, more than 70 research journal articles and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, with such a glittering and outstanding set of achievements, it's our honor to introduce our second speak, keynote speaker tonight, Professor Dr. Jos Nandikara. We are glad to have you here, sir. And for sure, and for, and for sure we owe you a special thanks for being here, although today being the Good Friday and you attended the discussion without any objection. Once again, we really appreciate your presence tonight. So in a Christian uh, sense, Fasting can be an attitude completely or partially abstaining from any kind of food. However, fasting in Christianity essentially may have some similar meaning with other religions, but may differ in practices and in other ways also. 
So what are your opinions about fasting in Christianity? Thank you very much, Sharfla Sulfika, for the kind words of welcome. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey and other organizers for inviting me for this session on fasting in world religions. Today is Good Friday, and most Christians would be fasting uh, today. I wish you, assuming that this is uh, majority of my audience are from Muslim friends, wish you all the blessings of Ramadan. Fasting in world religions, there are similarities and differences. What it is, basically same, abstaining from food, drinks, and sexual pleasures for a period of time. It could also be certain food and drink or no food and drinking. So this is given, sometimes are given obligatory, depending on the church, depending on the state of your life. For example, most churches would make it obligatory on Good Friday, and many uh, churches would make it obligatory on all Fridays, and also before the, the vigil, we say, the day before, as we prepare for great feast. There is also fasting before Christmas. And most of it is optional. The monks do it. There are particular restrictions and regulations depending on which order you belong. But there are also lay people who are fasting, perhaps even more than the monks. What is focused more on, <coughs> more on that free will? You do it freely and lovingly to the extent that is possible. For example, this was, we are preparing for Easter Sunday, is the Easter Sunday, 50 days back or 40 days back, we start fasting. Some of us will not take any meat or alcoholic drinks, fish, uh, milk products, and even egg. Some will fast from or only meat. Some will be fasting from meat and fish. In different ways, people, depending on their spirituality, devotions, state of life, they do it. Who will do it? All of them, though it is obligatory for adults and monks, but there are other people, all of us are you know, encouraged to fast. Why do we fast? First of all, it would be following the command of Jesus and his tradition. Jesus said, those who want to my disciples, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. A Christian is one who follows Jesus. Jesus himself fasted 40 days before his public ministry from all food. And also as a Jew, he fasted as per the Jewish regulation. Jesus encouraged fasting <clears throat> as a spiritual exercise. It should not be to show people that one is fasting. So that fasting, what is happening here is putting limits to one's desires. Food drink and pleasures, including sex, are good, but postponing them and abstaining them from them for a period of time does put limits to our ego. Overcoming our ego and following Jesus is the heart of being a Christian. Die to yourself and be like Christ. A Christian should be asking, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say in this context? So the focus for the fasting would be Jesus. And fasting is done also as a penance for my sin. We consider all of us have gone wrong, made sins. 
Meaning, what is a sin? When we will do not follow the will of God. When we do move away in our thoughts, words, and actions, actions could be of omissions or actions, commissions. What we do wrongly or when we do not do the right thing, we are committing sins. We are moving away from the path of the Lord. And as in other cases, there is restitution. When you do sin, you as a penance, you fast. Basically, we identify four temptations. Temptations of the bodily pleasures, temptation for wealth, temptation for ple uh, temptations for power, temptation for honor. And denying them, they are good in themselves, but they are not substitute for God or God's blessing. So giving the highest honor to God is the way of fasting. Therefore, fasting is a form of prayer. Fasting is a preparation for prayer. In itself, it's a form of worship because we acknowledge God is the <clears throat> all good. The command is love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And equally important is love of God, love of neighbor. Jesus brought these two, love of God and love of neighbor, so close as they say, first commandment and second commandment. And he would say, the second as important as the first. Therefore, fasting has a communitarian dimension. One, you share the fruits of the fasting. If you save money, you give to the poor. If you save food, you give to the, uh, to the poor. Because in uh, following Jesus' teaching, the neighbor is not one who stays close to you or a fellow Christian. He, a neighbor is someone who is in need. So share your resources, physical as well as spiritual, with those who are in need. So the fasting, it should be sharing those fruits of your fasting, both physical and spiritual, with the neighbors. Neighbors meaning those who are in need. So the three fundamental pillars of most religion, prayer, fasting, and charity, these three come together in fasting. They are interrelated. The purpose is to set limits on my desires and my passions and follow the path of the law. Try to be like Jesus and follow his precepts, his life. And these days, our fasting is not just from food, but all kinds of things. For example, recently, Pope Francis, the head of the Catholic Church, he said, Fast from hurting words and say kind words. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. Fast from worries and have trust in God. Fast from complaint and contemplate simplicity. Fast from pressures and be prayerful. Fast from bitterness and fill your hearts with joy. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate to others. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. Fast from words and be silent so you can listen. So fasting is important physically, psychologically, and spiritually to put limits on my own passions and desires and to be like Jesus. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I will be happy to clarify, if I could, any thoughts 
or clarify questions that you have. Thank you once again to the organizers for this opportunity. Thank you the participants for your patient listening. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Jos Nandikara. And also, I would like to mention that um, he accentuated the point that fasting in Christianity uh, is mainly because, uh, I, I mean, like, it's mainly because that Jesus has focused on fasting. And it's also a prayer of, uh, I mean, it's like a form of prayer. And also he said that fasting is important spiritually, physically, and also psychology. If I'm not wrong, uh, many prophets uh, in uh, Christianity like David, he has also fasted for the healing of the sick child, if I'm not wrong. So like, um, likewise, there are many prophets um, who have been engaged uh, in uh, fasting in order to sometimes uh, to get more connected with the God Jesus. So yeah, once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Jos Nandikara for enhancing the understanding of fasting in Christianity. Yeah, uh, well, moving on to our next, I mean, the third guest speaker tonight, who is the Hindu prominent Sri Swami Swatmananda. Before being ordained as a monk, he has earned a dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Electronic Engineering and Computer Science. He has completed his master's in international management and in global master of business administration. He has traveled great distance to learn from the foremost experts of Vedic knowledge. Today, Sri Swami Swatmananda lectures on Vedic knowledge, including yoga, Vedic astrology, Ayurveda, Vastu, and Vedanta. His rare combination of innate skills, broad life experiences, and dedicated study translates into a uniquely comprehensive approach to teaching and applying Vedic wisdom in modern times. We are much excited to have you tonight and your presence is of much value to us. Coming to the point, what is fasting in Hinduism? There may be differences and also even similarities compared to other religions. As I know, there are certain auspicious days for fasting in Hinduism. Generally, what is fasting in Hinduism? Over to you, Sri Swami Swatmananda. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well? I suppose so. Yes, uh, we can. Great. Hear you. Okay. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This was uh, a rather unexpected. I just happened to be in India these few months. I normally live in the U.S., so I want to give my thanks to uh, the organizers uh, to make this happen. It's uh, also, I'm very pleased to uh, present uh, the Hindu perspective on, on fasting. So without going into much uh, uh, delay, I'll just jump into it. So in Hinduism, uh, there is actually two reasons why we fast. One is for health reasons. And the second one is actually to uh, um, to pacify or to uh, reduce some of the difficulties that we experience in life. Because all of us, as you know, we always have challenges, we have difficulties, we have problems, and, uh, and some ways of resolving those problems are by fasting. So let me address the uh, health reason first. In Ayurveda, as you know, Ayurveda is the healing uh, system in India. Uh, and it's based on uh, the Vedic uh, body of knowledge called the Vedas. And in Ayurveda, which, which talks about the human health, it uh, reveals how the human body works. And one of the interesting thing is that when we eat food, we constantly, um, we, the food that is eaten, it takes about 24 hours to digest fully. Now, when we, when we eat a food at, let's say, lunch or dinner or breakfast, that food, uh, the nutrients through the uh, digestive system gets extrapolated, it gets extracted, and it pushes into the body for supplying energy and nutrients and so on for the rest of the body to function. But interestingly, the same uh, vein or the same outlet, the pores that uh, take in the food, 
is also the same force that actually puts out the toxins. So it's basically a two-way street where food goes into the digestive system and then there are whole pores attached to the digestive system. And from there, uh, the uh, food gets absorbed into the body. Now, if we keep on eating all day uh, or different frequently, because there's also this habit, I know in America, we tend to eat a lot uh, or drink a lot. We're constantly drinking or we're constantly eating. You'll always see somebody has a drink in their hand is actually very unhealthy because it doesn't allow for the toxins or the unwanted uh, uh, parts of the body or, or to be pushed back into the digestive system. So in essence, what happens when you're fasting is that it gives a break. So it allows for, uh, for the body to push the toxins through the same pores into the digestive system, and then it gets eliminated. So basically it is a two way street. So for instance, we recommend uh, uh, for in Ayurveda a 16 hour fast, meaning that you eat during the day and then for 16 hours you don't eat. And what, what happens during that period is that all the antioxidants uh, or the toxins in uh, Sanskrit we call it ama, gets pushed back into the digestive system and then gets eliminated the next day. So it's a very nice way to keep your health, body healthy. I know a lot of my Muslim friends who are fasting during Ramadan, uh, when I'm spending time with them, or sometimes they invite me to, the, to break the fast with them, uh, I see they, they always comment that they are much more healthier when they are fasting and they feel stronger because uh, they're fasting. And this is a, a really uh, a, one of the essences of, uh, of the health benefits of fasting. For instance, if you fast for seven days or 10 days or even 20 or 30 days, and we'll talk about the different ways of fasting, you'll find that you'll be amazed at the amount of time it takes to eat and to cook and to be done. I fasted for almost 10 days and I was so shocked how much time goes into eating and how much more time goes into eating. And when you just take that out, you'll be amazed uh, the time that you have for other things. And also it doesn't mean that you feel any worse. I felt that after fasting for seven days, I was still feeling much stronger and healthier. In fact, I was feeling much more cleaner. My body felt clean in a way. So uh, there's tremendous health benefits. And I know all traditions, uh, uh, religious traditions actually talk about the health benefits. But in Ayurveda, we know exactly why that is because it allows for toxins and antioxidants and so on to be dumped back into the digestive state system so that it gets eliminated, okay? Now, the second reason, as you know, in Hinduism, we follow astrology and uh, in astrology, what happens is that uh, we, we recommend uh, two times to fast. One is uh, you fast on the 11th day from the new moon and 11 day after the full moon. So moon, moon plays a very important role. So this is for generally, uh, for everyone who wants to do it, they talk about fasting on the 11th day after the new moon and 11th day after the full moon. That is because on that particular day, it's uh, very conducive for uh, spirituality. You'll find also in some traditions, you fast for 10 days and then 11 day you uh, break the fast or so on. But um, uh, if you fast on, on the 11th day, that uh, allows for the toxins to come into the body, but also at the same time, it enhances your spiritual connection with God. Uh, when we fast, uh, when, we, when we fast, what happens is, uh, or if you, uh, most of you are fasting, I'm sure you'll realize that you feel, you feel uh, spiritually somehow connected with God. Uh, you feel lighter, you feel that you are more uh, sensitive. And uh, a lot of this happens when you are not pumping your body with food all the time. When you pump food or, or into your body all the time, the body takes drains so much energy to break that food. And that's why you find that even during Ramadan or people who fast on fasting days that after one or two days, when you start dealing and getting, uh, getting over the hunger issues, 
um, that you're feeling much more stronger because that energy that it takes to break down food and digest the food is so much that uh, you actually save that energy for doing other things. And, uh, and this is a typically, um, it is very helpful when you are uh, uh, fasting on certain spiritual days. So yes, certain spiritual days that we can fast, but typically for general public, it's, uh, it's the 11th day. And then we have some other celebrations where it is recommended to fast because during that time, um, uh, we get more connected with God. For instance, during Shivratri, uh, it's also another very powerful time to fast all night and, and uh, get into, uh, get and feel that connection. Now, uh, the other thing about uh, fasting is that uh, one of the ways to reduce uh, human suffering for each person, we look at the moon sign. Okay, so we see where the moon is placed in the zodiac, and then based on that, we recommend which day is good for you to fast. So you'll find some uh, Hindu women, because most people don't follow the tradition so much. However, it is highly recommended that uh, based on your moon sign, uh, uh, the, day, uh, the day that is placed, or, or whether it's uh, one, one of the seven uh, days of the week, you fast on that particular day. So you'll find that uh, Hindu women or Hindu mothers who are cooking, they'll actually start their fast after prayers in the morning and they will not eat all day. And in the evening, they'll break the fast and uh, continue uh, with their meal. Uh, there is also um, fasting for uh, religious functions, which, uh, you know, which happens at different times. And uh, there's so many of those. Uh, which take place again for it is more to feel the spiritual connection but when you fast on a particular day based on your moon sign a lot of that is to help you reduce uh, your suffering so you re it re helps reduce some of the struggles you have in life and you'll find that you end up getting more blessings because you have done that for swami like me, or sannyasis, we tend to fast on a regular basis, uh, depending on uh, our spiritual practices. But before we become sannyasis, for instance, we go through a three-day ritual, to, and we just fast, we just drink a, a sip of water for three days, and in fact, we also stay up all night chanting and doing a yajna, mean, meaning doing a fire ritual. So that takes uh, quite, uh, it's a very difficult, long process, but once you get uh, used to fasting, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very nice. So, so uh, there are also people at different stages in life, they fast for different reasons, but all of it, most of it is based on uh, uh, reducing some of the suffering that a person experiences. Um, and, and it frankly does help. Um, uh, when you fast, let's say you pick a day and you fast all day, or if you pick uh, certain spiritual days and you fast during that time, you'll find that some of the challenges in your life gets reduced, or uh, you, sometimes you even find uh, that you get inspiration or you get uh, suggestions in your mind to, to do certain things in the right way. So there's a, there, those are the, some of the real uh, spiritual benefits that we have in um, in uh, Hinduism. Um, thinking of anything else, uh, I would say uh, I would say pretty much. Uh, just in summary, I would uh, just conclude with uh, the two main benefits: uh, our health and uh, spiritual connection. Also, to reduce some of the suffering that we go through um, uh, is why Hindus uh, fast on certain days. There's also sometimes when uh, people, when somebody passes or somebody uh, departs from us, uh, I think there's a uh, certain days when we fast so that uh, we allow uh, for that person to try and uh, to, uh, to migrate or to tr transition in a peaceful way. So there is some of that too. And what we mean by fasting also is that typically we just, uh, we can drink water. Uh, unlike in Ramazan, I think you, you're not even allowed to drink water. Uh, in Hinduism, uh, you you start fasting in the morning at uh, sunrise, and uh, you can drink sips of water, not a lot of water, 
but nothing until you fast. But some people, uh, you know, they sometimes if it's too hungry, they eat the fruit and all that. So, you know, it's pretty flexible. <laughs> we don't have rigid rules, but uh, if you're trying to get a spiritual connection, um, uh, then it's really advisable to not eat anything. And, uh, you know, hunger really is the first two, three days that you have to deal with it. And then later on, it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes routine. It becomes quite okay. So I'll conclude my uh, presentation from the Hindu perspective uh, with that. And uh, if you have any questions, feel, please feel free to leave uh, some messages. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I have another commitment. And so I'll probably be leaving at 8.30. So I'll have to take uh, your leave, which I truly apologize for it. I didn't realize it was going to be longer than that. That's why I have some people waiting for me right now. <laughs> so I might have to and attend to them as soon as I'm done here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, as Sri Swami Swatmananda said that there are main, mainly two reasons for Hindus, Hindus to fast, mainly, uh, I mean, the first one is because of health reasons, and the other is to reduce the difficulties which we face in life. So, and also he, like uh, we men he mentioned that underlying principle behind fasting is to be found in Ayurveda. So, um, and also like, um, as he said, as I know, like um, Hindu, like fasting in Hinduism is also a kind of spiritual discipline. So, because well, our bodies are always uh, very insistent and our, because of us and stomachs are insistent. And also our tongue is very insistent. Uh, they like regularly say, feed me, feed me, feed me. And then it becomes like a slavery. So like uh, to like turn our mind away from all the uh, pleasure, from the earthly pleasure and the senses, it has also called as a, um, a spiritual discipline. Yeah, well, thank you uh, so much, uh, Sri Swami Swatmananda for sharing your opinions with us on fasting in Hinduism. Well, uh, moving on to our final guest speaker of the day. Before that, I would like to remind that um, there is a Q&A session at the end of uh, this program. So like, if you all have any questions, uh, you can like uh, drop it down in any language you like. Okay, so moving on to our last final guest speaker tonight, who is none other than an Islamic scholar, Dr. Muhammad Ismat Ramzi. He is the editor of the Malaysian Online Journal at the chair, and the chairperson of the Education for Humanism and Social Advancement Research Center, Faculty of Education, University of Malaya in Malaysia. He studied his first degree in Arabic language in University of Peradeniya in 2001. He perceived the PhD in Comparative Religion at the International Islamic University in Malaysia in 2012. Upon his graduation with a PhD, he has published more than 62 research papers in international review journals. He is also not only a researcher, but also a peace activist. We are much pleased to have you here, sir, with us tonight, and your presence is an immense pleasure for us. It is over to you, sir, to talk on today's topic, which is fasting. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shafla, for your kind introduction. Uh, dear Venerable uh, Reverends, Professors, Students, and Organizers of this uh, webinar, my dear panelists, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be upon you all, and may this event be useful and comprehensive. Ramadan Kareem for Muslims, and Good Friday for my Christian friends. First of all, I would like to thank Allah, the Almighty, and to the Muslim Majlis, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka, for giving me an opportunity to share my thoughts on fasting in Islam. Before moving to the topic, I would like to thank my panelists, Venerable Vijitapura Gunaratna Tera, Reverend Professor Dr. Jus Nandikar, and Sri Swami Swananda uh, for accepting the in my in invitation to the present on fasting in the respective religion. Fasting in the month of Ramadan is an essential ritual of iba or ibadah in Islam. 
It is one among five articles of Islam known as Arkan al-Islam. These five articles are the proclamation of creed, shahada, prayer, salah, fasting, asaw, compulsory alms, giving, zakat, and pilgrimage to Makkah, hajj. Since we have many other faith participants in this forum, let me briefly explain the overall understanding of worship or ibadah in Islam before discussing fasting. Like any other religions, faith is a fundamental in Islam. Faith is the convictions, compliance, and commitment to the religion. The worship, including fasting, have a strong connection with faith. Faith, on the Arabic terms Iman, is the eternal matter resting in a potentially active ally. It needs to express itself to be actualized. Hence, the worship of Ibadah is the manifestation of faith or the worship is the practical expression of faith. Allah, the Almighty God, took the responsibility to explain how to express faith to humanity, so it's because these both are beyond human minds and limitations. As far as Allah created human being and his mind, he programmed the human mind with a certain limitation. One such limitation is that the human minds can encapsulate the matters only within the experience, practice, sensual, or mental. As far as a God existence beyond any, any of these limitations of the human mind, God took the responsibility to explain himself. And God in Islam is known through his very own words as described by himself, reflected in his beautiful name, Asma'ul Husna. Since Allah undertook the responsibility to explain himself and his religions to humanity, it is appropriate for him to explain how to express the faith and means of reaching him. Hence, Allah himself instituted the expression of faith or ibadah or worship. To the, to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through Angel Ibn Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explained this worship and demonstrated this worship to Muslims. Hence, like faith, the expression of faith in rituals and rites are godly. It requires practice expressions, correct constructions, and proper performances, and it cannot be imaginatory or chaotic. As such, all form of worship in innovations is considered bidah, which is strictly prohibited. It is because innovation in rituals and rites may lead to Muslim astray, ultimately worshipping everything else but Allah. It shows that the rituals and rites in Islam are practical expression of faith, which cannot be imaginative or fanciful. Since rituals and rites in Islam are formally instructed and instituted by Allah, they cannot be perfectly performed carelessly. As far as Allah, the Almighty, has instituted the rituals and rites in Islam, it is comprehensive. It co incorporates the spiritual, intellectual, physical, intrapersonal, and interpersonal dimensions. The comprehensiveness of these rituals and rites can be explained in vertical and horizontal correlation. The vertical correlation, hablum in Allah, describe the individual communication with God directly through ibadah without any mediator or priest. A Muslim can tell his or her issues to the God and can ask help to resolve these issues directly. Allah said in the Quran, chapter 50, verse number 16, and we have already created man 
and know what is his soul visible to him. And we are closer to him than his jugular vein. According to this verse, Allah hears human communication as he even hears the worshipper of the soul. The horizontal correlation, hablu minan nas, means an individual connect with fellow human beings through worship. For instance, fasting is a way of realizing people's hunger and motivating charity. Hence, the worship or ibadah has vertical and horizontal dimensions. Similarly, worship also has a spiritual and social dimension. The spiritual dimensions known as Abdullah, this aspect is plain that an individual internalizes the faith and recognize their connection with God through worship. This is an, an intrapersonal aspect of worship. The social part is another dimension of worship known as Khalifatullah. This aspect can be explained as an interpersonal dimension of worship. With this, this, with this brief introduction to the rituals and rites, and its connection to the faith, let's briefly discuss fasting in Islam. Fasting in Ramadan is the third article of Islam. As mentioned in the beginning, during Ramadan, Muslims must abstain from taking any food or drink from dawn to dusk. From Sri Lanka, for instance, uh, 4.50 a.m. to 6.15 uh, p.m., or around four, 14 hours. According to the Quran, the wisdom behind fasting is to learn self-restraint and humbleness and grateful to the God. As we listen to many my previous presenters, Venerable Gunarat Natera and Reverend uh, Prof. Jews, and also from the uh, uh, priest um, Swami Swananda, fasting is not an exclusive Islam. Almost all religions have some form of fasting in various ways and with a different level of abstention and intensity. Fasting in many religions is a compelling way of enhancing spirituality. The Quran said that the people in ancient time also fasted and Allah had instructed the earlier religious community to fast. Oh, you we have believed decreed upon you is fasting as it was decreed upon those before you that you may learn self-restraint and become righteous. Muslim during the whole month of Ramadan abstain from eating and drinking and from sensory activities for 14 hours. During this period, they should restrain from bad conduct, evil thoughts, and useless and improper action. They have to focus and be involved only in priceworthy actions. Throughout this fasting month, the rituals are intensified and there are also special, special prayers only for this month called Tarawi. The unique arm giving Zakat al-Fitr. In addition, the Holy Quran is more intensively read during this period and charitable work are regarded to be even more meritorious if performed during this month. Ramadan is especially singled out for this auspicious fasting rituals. It's because the month when the angel Jibreel first brought the revelation, the Quran, to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran says, Ramadan is a month which was sent down the Quran as a guide to the humanity also clear sign for guidance and judgment between right and wrong. So every one of you who is a present at, at his home during this month should spend it fast. But if anyone is still on a journey, they prescribed should be made up by, by days later. This every Muslim should fast during Ramadan, except for the sick, and those on journey. The exemption also include women in menstruation, in birth confine, confinement, and nor, uh, nursing babies. 
However, they have to make up the missed fasting day by fasting an equal number of days on other days as convenient. Nonetheless, those who will find it very hard to fast at all due to old age or continuous ill health can replace fasting by giving charity to the deserving. Children below the age of puberty also become exempted. Although fasting in the month of Ramadan, like any other worship in Islam, is the manifestation of faith or conviction and commitment as well as the practical expression of faith, it has a particular objective. The Quran chapter 2 verse number 183 explains this objective and says fasting during Ramadan is a mandatory for Muslims and require them to abstain from food, drink and other physical needs from dawn until sunset to develop the quality of righteousness, taqwa. It means the objective of fasting is developing self-restraint and increasing quality of righteousness, taqwa. Hence, the fasting is the meaningless if a, if a person fails to learn restraint and become righteous. In addition, fasting must help an individual to avoid unethical behavior such as lying, gossiping, and engaging in harmful activities. As mentioned before, fasting, like any other rituals, integrated the spiritual, intellectual, physical, interpersonal, and interpersonal dimensions. From top to bottom, the person who fasts establishes communication with God directly by abstaining from food, drink, and other activities and expressing his submission to God. Although the part person who fasts can have food and drink without people's knowledge, he or she abstains from food and drink and other sensory activities. It is because he wants the love of God and his appreciation. Hence, nothing stops this person from having food and beverage except God's love and gratitude. From the horizontal perspective, the individual who fast makes the connection with fellow human beings. They realize the pain of others and involve in community services. And fasting has a vertical and horizontal dimension. Similarly, fasting also has spiritual and social dimensions. As he submits to God by abstaining from food, drink, and other desires, he increases his spirituality. In this aspect, the fasting person internalizes the faith and recognizes his position in, in line with the God command. Furthermore, social element of fasting motivate him to have righteous interaction with others. The fasting person therefore learn to live with others without harming anyone while establishing ethical behavior. In conclusion, fasting is an important act of Islam that can help study Muslims' spiritual and ethical dimension in day-to-day -day life. Furthermore, fasting also helps to understand the Islamic perspective of others and other religions. From the presentation from Buddhist Christianity, Hinduism, we realize the commonalities in religion in terms of ethics and morality. Self-control is the objective of fasting in Buddhism. Overcoming ego is the objective in Christianity. Aim of fasting in Hinduism is physical and spiritual benefit. Although way of practicing fasting is different, all religion focus on self-control, developing ethical and moral values. Hence, fasting, promotes self-reflections and ethical behavior and improve interper interpersonal relations. University students should be encouraged to fast to promote social harmony in the multicultural, multicultural context. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Yes, uh, as Dr. Ismet, uh, Muhammad Ismet Ramzi uh, said that, fasting is one of the uh, main pillars of Islam. And also like, uh, uh, more than calling it uh, as a month of uh, fast, I mean, month of like staying away from food and stuff. Like uh, it is a month where the Holy Quran has been sent to the uh, sent to the humankind for the guidance of humanity. So yeah, once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ismat Ramzi, for that insightful knowledge, full keynote speech. Yeah, uh, before moving into the next session, I would like to say that uh, Sri Swami Swatmananda has left the session because uh, of some uh, a busy schedule. Um, so like he has apologized for not answering the questions. Um, and then now let's move on to the next session. And it's over to you, Zamri. Thank you, Safla. I hope you guys have a vast idea about fasting and also you may have a lot of questions running in your mind, I hope. So this is the time for that. Now we are waiting to Q&A session, question and answering session. So if you guys have any questions to be asked from our guest speakers tonight, you can ask and you can type it and we'll make sure for you provide answer through our respective guests. So I have received uh, plenty of questions. Uh, it's time for uh, giving uh, answer, asking the questions. Uh, first, I would like to invite uh, Reverend Vijitapura Gunaratna, Senior Lecturer, Department of Pali and Buddhist Studies, University of Kalania. Uh, sir, uh, we have plenty of questions for you. Uh, I will ask the questions and you can give a brief introduction to us. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, why there are different types of fasting for the monks and laymen in Buddhism? Could you explain it, sir? Okay, thank you very much for asking this question. And also, I saw another question also related to this. So, both questions are equal to each other. Therefore, I can answer for one question for both uh, one, one answer for those questions. So second question is why different types of fasting for people of different grades in Buddhism? What is the purpose? So like that of uh, the questions are raised here. So, well, uh, I would say that there are two types of society in Buddhism. One is the society of monks and nuns that is called the Sangha community. The second one is lay society. So what is the Sangha community or society of uh, monks and nuns? So people who renounce already and enter to this dispensation, they are entered into the society of Sangha. So they are included uh, as uh, the monks and the nuns. So the, the, they have already renounced. They, they have already refrained from the uh, the, the so society that I mean the uh, household life they have no any attachment with the household life so therefore they are aiming only for the uh, the final goals so therefore for monks uh, the, with regard to the fasting so I, I showed you there are two different uh, the ways to follow one under guidance of the ascetic practices and also one under the uh, uh, what you call uh, the rules hmm? in, in the path book of Patimokka. So because so they are not thinking of this life as simple. So therefore, if one does not practice or the follow these rules, he is punished. Hmm? So here, there, there is the, the, uh, the, with regard to the, the minor rule, there is no any punishment, only the confessed. So like that of things, there are for no any excuse for the monks and nuns where the, with regard to the Buddhism, if they follow the follow to achieve the final goal. 
Therefore, there is no any simple ways for the monks. The second one is the lay society. Uh, the, the purpose of lay society is to make the bondage. There is a bond between house and uh, the, between wife and husband and between the uh, parents and the uh, children. There is attachments. While they are spending household life, they have to perform their duties. While performing these duties, they have to practice these type of morality too. Therefore, they, they have already uh, laid down the simple ways to practice. Therefore, the fasting comes under the, uh, the, the precepts. That is not a rule. It not comes under the deeper sense of the perspectives like that. Therefore, Buddhism uh, the believes that if one renounce already, he has to aim to achieve his final goal within this life. But household life will differ from this. Therefore, they have simple ways while spending their household life, they can continue. Then one day, that means the, in the sansaric life, if they want to achieve their final goal, then they have to renounce uh, already and uh, achieve their final goals. Until then, they can go with the simple ways. So that is the difference between uh, lay society and the monk society and the, uh, the purposes of those. Therefore, there are some differences between this. The, the, the fasting also refer to this type of things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Revan and Vijita Bhargunaratna. Uh, you have explained uh, plenty of things. That means uh, fasting in Buddhism is a precepts, not a rule. So likewise, you have differentiated monks and laymen. Uh, thank you so much. And we have another question from you to ask. Uh, shall I ask it? Sure. Uh, what are the spiritual benefits uh, in fasting in Buddhism? Could you please explain it uh, briefly? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, it comes under the morality, the the, the in the in the uh, the precepts. So this is one benefit, and also health benefits. Hmm? So if one dies, hmm? so the is uh, the whole things are related to this. Therefore, healthy benefit is the most compulsory uh, in the in the uh, the list of benefits in the uh, Buddhist perspective. And also the uh, spiritual development for monks and the nuns. As I mentioned earlier, while uh, the monks and nuns are following the ascetic practices, they can the, uh, the develop their concentration. So these are the benefits in uh, while uh, the practice in the, uh, the fasting in Buddhism. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Ravan and Vijita Varuna Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have plenty of questions. Uh, now it's time to ask questions from Professor Dr. Jos Nandikara, Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Dharma, Regional Director, Globe Ethics, Net India, Professor of Philosophy, Dharmaram Vidya Sestram, and Christ University, Bangalore, India. So we have a lot of questions to ask. Uh, is this time for giving a, a brief, inter a brief uh, explanation for our audience? Those who have raised a lot of questions from you, sir. Um, what are the rules for fasting in Christianity? Is there any mandatory rules or is there any rules that uh, Christianity to break the fasting or the following the fasting? Uh, there are no specific rules applicable for all Christians. Within Christianity, there are a number of churches, number of denominations, and number of gatherings. As far as I know, there is no one rule, though there is fasting in every tradition. Most of the tradition, as far as I know, would focus on to do the fasting, not as a result of rule, but as an expression of piety, an expression of love for God. The Catholic Church, where I come from, 
there is a rule that you fast on Good Friday and on the Ash Wednesday. That's the beginning of the Lent. And I'm coming from within the Catholic Church, a Suru Malabar church, church from Kerala, where we have fasting obligatory on all the Fridays of Lent. So these are, there are no definite rules applicable to all Christians. But if there is a fasting, it should be coming from a love for God rather than any of the rules. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Professor Jos, Dr. Jos Sandhikar said that there are no any specific rules that uh, Christianity religion shows. So, uh, as a good slave of the God, we have to fast in Christianity. So, sir, I have another question from you. Sir, could you please explain the fasting days? Is there uh, any prayers conducting to break the fasting in Christianity? Thank you for the question that also there is no specific prayers before the fasting or to break the fast. Our fasting is different from the Ramadan fasting from dawn to dusk. Our fasting maybe some of us would eat only once and most probably that would be lunch. And some of us would fast by skipping one meal and that also could be most probably lunch. Or some of us would be fasting, skipping some of the food items. We will have food, but very light meal, minimum meal. Because the purpose of fasting is not just not eating, but developing that love. But at the same time, setting limits to one's own desires. So I used to tell in my community, I should be fasting from fruits. Because the most delicious food for me is fruits. And to say no to fruits is, for me personally, very difficult than saying no to meat or fish. So the, the spirit behind the fasting is more important than any particular prayer before fasting or to break the fasting. Because the fasting is more of a flexible way. The prayers are independent from the fasting ritual. There are prayers, daily prayers, and for example, being today uh, the Good Friday, I would have spent some six to seven hours in prayer, uh, morning three to four hours and during the day and also, and I'm also fasting. Thank you. I hope I'm clarifying. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Professor Jos Nandikara, you have explained a lot of things. Uh, I hope uh, all the guys who understand, understood all the things. Uh, thank you so much, for, sir, for your valuable times. Thank you. As soon as we have... Uh, welcome, sir. Well, we'll move to the next. Uh, we have a lot of questions from Dr. Mohammed Smith Ramzi, editor of Malaysian Online Journal of Education Management, chair of the Education for Humanism and Social Advancement Research Center, Faculty of Education, University of Malaya, Malaysia. So we have a lot of questions to ask from you. Uh, sir, how sick a person have to be to skip fasting in Islam? Can, uh, no, me. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your question. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, how sick a person how to be to skip fasting in Islam? Ah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, the a sick person uh, he can skip the uh, he or she can skip the fasting until he or she cures. And uh, I mean, within uh, uh, the whole the year, I mean, one Ramadan to other Ramadan, uh, he or she has to uh, fast the for the days he is sick. So this is the I mean normal rule. However, if the the person is uh, you know continuous sick or cannot have in the, because of the old age or something. Uh, uh, if, I mean, uh, continuous illness or something, 
in that case, he has to escape and he has to uh, give charity uh, instead of uh, fasting. Did I Thank you so much. So we have another question. Uh, what are the types of fasting in Islam? Ah. Is there any? Ah, yeah. Thank you very much again. So this is actually the fasting of Ramadan is a compulsory fasting. In addition to that, there are other optional fasting. In optional fasting, we have annually uh, some optional fasting. We have uh, monthly optional fasting, and as well as we have weekly optional fasting. However, the fasting continuously without having break uh, in after the Ramadan and as an optional fasting is not encouraged in Islam. The, the, the person who like, who want to fast optional after the Ramadan, he can, but he has to break. He cannot continuously fast. So the, usually the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu encouraged uh, two fasting, uh, I mean, especially in the Friday and uh, Thursday and Friday weekly, and as well as uh, monthly, there are uh, 14, uh, sorry, 13, 14, and 15 of moon, uh, they, the monthly fasting, and as well as there are some other annual fasting. So these are the fasting, actually, this is the uh, optional fasting. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Smad Ramzi. You explained uh, the fasting. I have asked some questions. That means, uh, what are the types of fasting in Islam? So you have explained uh, as far in Islam, we can say in fasting as Saum. So Saum is a fall and also Sunnah. So likewise, I hope uh, all the audience have got a proper knowledge about the fasting in Islam as well. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And thank you so much for being us today. Can I as say, well, uh, sorry, can I say one sentence more? Sure, sir. Uh, you can say. There is one fasting which is obligatory. That's uh, what we call as Holy Communion. Well, those of you know that the Catholics, especially in other, other traditions also, we have the celebration of the Holy Mass. So before you, if you are receiving the Eucharist, you should be fasting one hour before that. Some people would fast more, but it is obligatory, at least in the Catholic Church. In the other churches are also similar, because there was a question prayer and fasting, its connection. So the most important prayer is Holy Eucharist. And before the Eucharistic communion, one hour of fasting is obligate. Thank you. Thank you so much for your deep explanation, uh, Dr. Professor Jos Nandikara. Uh, now we came to the end of today's uh, Fasting in Religions live webinar. So now it's time to uh, give in the word of thanks. So I would like to invite Akil Irfan, Assistant Secretary, Yeah, I guess that Zamri has a, a connection issue and has left. So yeah, we have come to the finale of today's session. And uh, to give away the word of thanks, I would like to call upon uh, Akil Irfan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Bismillahir Rahmanir uh, Respectable Chief Guest, Mr. Rajik Sir, keynote speakers, 
attendees and my dear colleagues. First of all, I take a moment to thank God Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to address you all. On behalf of the Muslim Majlis of University of Peradeniya and the organizing committee of this event, I extend my heartiest thanks to our keynote speakers who spared their priceless time with us in a very short notice. Reverend Vijitapura Gunaratne Tero, Senior Lecturer of the Department of Pali and Buddhist Studies of University of Kelaniya, PhD candidate, University of Malaya. Professor Dr. Jose Nandikar, Editor-in-Chief of Journal of Dharma, Regional Director of Globethics.net India. Professor of Philosophy of Dharma Vidya Kashram and Christ University, Bangalore, India. Dr. Mohammed Ismat Ramzi, editor of the Malaysian Online Journal of Education Management, chairperson of the Education of Humanism and Social Advancement Research Center, Faculty of Education, University of Malaya, Malaysia. Swaswami Sapananda, dual Bachelor of Science degrees in Electronic Engineering and Computer Science, and Master's in International Management and Global Master of Business Administration. Also, I extend my thanks to our attendees who also enriched the program with their thoughtful doubts. Even though the session is focused, we serve as a gateway, or this session will facilitate you to find unity in diversity. We hope that we'll be able to respect and value our fellow cultures and their tradition and beliefs and to move a beautiful and happiness and successful life. Once again, I thank all of you for joining with us and making this event a great successful one. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving the water. Yes, Zamri, you can continue. Sure, Shafla, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Akil Irfan, Assistant Secretary, Muslim Majlis, University of Peradeniya, to give gave us the word of thanks. Now it's time for the conclusion. To conclude this most awaited and the most um, brilliant event that has done by Muslim Majlis Executive Committee for the year 2023. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and patience. We are extremely privileged to have you all here today. Furthermore, we appreciate your valuable time and patience and you have shown today. Additionally, I would like to thank our guests for giving their valuable time to sparkle our event. Thank you so much again. Furthermore, I would allow to thank my team for their hard working in arranging this event, especially all the executive member of University of Peradeniya's Muslim Majlis for the year 2023. They have done a brilliant job behind the scene as well. Coming to the end of the day, we wish you a happiness, prosperity, and peace. Thank you so much all the participants for making this event successful. And we are signing off from you. I am Zamri Ahmed with Shafla Sufikar. Thank you so much. Yes, have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye.